In this episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about <laughs> walking tuberculosis, how girls can murder two, <laughs> the worst Yay. character in the history of worst characters, and how we found a new favorite audiobook narrator to stalk <laughs> in our discussion of All These Bodies by Kendara Blake, narrated by Matt Godfrey. Sorry, Matt Godfrey, sorry. Hey everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult books, series, authors, and voice actors that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire, and today we're going to discuss All These Bodies by Kandara Blake. Standard disclaimer, if you haven't read this book, please remember that Fictional Hangover is all about spoilers. If you haven't read or listened and don't want to be spoiled, stop listening to us and go read or listen to the book, then come back. If you haven't done this moment to pretend that you have, or if you don't care about spoilers, or if you just like the show so much that you don't care about any of that, then listen up. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I'm so happy we're going to talk about vampires. <laughs> I know that everyone is shocked by this. Uh, we never talk about vampires, do we? Never. I've never even heard of a vampire before. Well, this is going to be an education. Oh, is it? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So good. <laughs> it's a book with a twist. Ah. Oh. Or seven. <laughs> Did you find any background information for this one? Because it is a very recent release. It is a very recent release. Um, I will say that <sighs> YA Under My Skin, our favorite Amy McCaw, has a chat with Kendara about this book. So you should go and check that out. But I pulled a little bit different background info from the book brats, and they ask, mm. what do you hope that readers will take away from all these bodies? And can, a body? Because they're stacking up. Yeah, there's, there's one or two bodies in this book. Um, Kendara said, I hope that they'll enjoy it, for one. Which I can just hear her <laughs> saying that, and it's... It's so much yeah. like more sarcastic and dry than than you would ever imagine. She is the driest. She's drier than the Sahara. I love it's her. great. I love her. She says, "I hope they'll enjoy lurking around this small Minnesota town in the 1950s that's been terrorized by these strange, horrible murders. I hope they'll be left thinking about the truth and belief and the kinds of stories that young women are allowed to tell." And I hope that they come to love Michael and Marie, because I really do. Oh. Me too, Kendara, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, before we even get started, do you know what I love almost most about this book? Other than the fact that, you know, Kendara wrote it and Kendara is an instant buy for me. Um, Apart from Kandara, yes. Yeah, K- Kandara <laughs> is instant buy. Vampire, instant buy. So this was just mm. immediately pre-order as soon as you find out about it. But um, what I really, really liked was the audiobook. The narrator, yes. Matt Godfrey, was just... Oh, there's one character, and we're going to get to him, and it's included in the summary... And I might curse about him, but oh my god, does Matt Godfrey do an amazing thing with this character that you just fucking hate. (laughs) Yes. But I loved him. I loved him because of the narration. It was perfect. And we'll have to talk more about that later. Yes. Exactly who this character sounds like, which is totally obscure. (laughs) <laughs> and nobody will understand it they won't um, but yeah I agree 110% uh, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll get to it we'll get to it, we'll I, get to like, it. are we going to have to are we going to have to stalk Matt Godfrey now and force him um, to join us I sometime I think yes yes yeah it was We'll, 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 this is discussion territory. Let's let's dial it back. 
and we'll need to give the summary first. Okay, okay. Everything you have said, I agree. Kondara, vampires, 1950s, different formatting concept. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 In the summer of 1958, the bloodless murders, sometimes called the Dracula murders, depending on which newspaper you're reading, were all over the news. They started in Nebraska, went through Iowa and Wisconsin, and ended in Minnesota. There were 17 victims of the bloodless murders, all found with slit wrists or sliced throats or deep gashes on their inner thighs. Every victim died seemingly peacefully of blood loss, but as you can gather from the name of the spree, there was no (laughs) blood found at any of the scenes. This was a story of the century, and it was shared by Marie Catherine Hale, the only person found alive at any of the crime scenes, minus a baby, but we don't count the baby. Was she a victim, or was she responsible? What follows is Marie's story, as told to Michael Jensen, a 17-year-old boy who wanted to be a journalist. No pressure. Don't count the baby. Don't count the baby. The last night of the killing spree, Michael and his buddy Percy were hanging out in Percy's old barn, talking about girls, when Percy's dad showed up and told them to get the dogs and come with him. Michael's dad, Sheriff Jensen, was out at the Carlson's house where Widow Thompson reported that the Carlson family had been murdered. The only survivor was the baby and the 15-year-old girl. Don't count the baby. (laughs) And the 15-year-old girl covered in blood standing in the living room. Marie Catherine Hill was a pretty girl who seemed much older than her 15 years and for some reason she decided to tell her story to Michael, but not just yet. It could be because he was a sheriff's son, or it could be because he's the only person who might believe her story. After the Carlson's funeral, Percy and Michael talked about how there were too many people there, people that just seemed to be there to be part of the sensation. They also talked about Marie Catherine Hale and how Percy heard she was going to be charged with all the murders, even though she's just a small girl. In Minnesota, where the murders ended... She couldn't be charged for the murders if she was just an accomplice. But in Nebraska, where they started, she could be. The boys decided to go to the park with some other friends from school, which led to them going to explore the Carlson's house. Inside, they found a rolled-up rug with a little bit of blood on it. Outside, they saw a face that didn't belong to anyone that they've ever seen before. Yikes! Who is looking in the window? I don't like it. No, I don't like thank it. You. No, thank you. We've mentioned this before. No. No. Stop it. No. Stop looking in windows, creeps. Honestly, ghosts and goonies and monsters are just pervs. <laughs> Some guys from the police station showed up to get them out of the house, and Michael ended up paying penance by cleaning the floors of the prison. He worked there some and it used to be his house, so it wasn't so weird that he'd be there. What was weird was that this was where Marie told Michael about Mercy Lena Brown, a girl from the 1800s who was accused of being a vampire and her heart was cut out of her corpse, burned and fed to her brother to stop him from becoming a vampire too. Yikes. She, she actually died of tuberculosis, and so did her brother. Yikes. Yeah. While Michael was there hearing about this terrible story, he also asked if the police saw anything out of the ordinary at the Carlson's house. Maybe any footprints in the flower beds? Nope. Excuse me, then who was outside the window? Ghosties and goonies and vampires. (sighs) Not long after this, the district attorney from Nebraska shows up. Benjamin Pilsen. And just get ready, because because he is literally one of the worst characters ever written in any story ever. I just... I want to say asshat, but that does not do justice to how horrible... No. 
this character no. is. And Matt Godfrey, bless you. You did it. Yeah. You made this terrible, terrible person even more terrible, and it was great. Yeah. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. So Benjamin Pilsen is sleazy about Marie being a pretty girl, and he wanted to take her back to Nebraska because there she could be capitally punished just for being an accomplice, whether she actually committed any crimes or not. This, of course, freaked Marie out. Probably his sleaziness did too, because fucking yikes. And just 15 months. Oh, just 15. Uh, so she declared that she would only tell her story to Michael. Everyone got into a fuss about this. But ultimately, after talks with the judges and officials from other states involved in the murders, Marie was allowed to tell Michael exactly what happened to her. Pilsen didn't agree, fought it every single step of the way, and he forced Michael to tape record his sessions with Marie. God, he's the worst. I hate him. I hate him. He hates him, precious. He hates him. Hates him, precious, yeah. Stupid, nasty dear. The interviews began shortly afterward and everyone at school and around town started pestering Michael about his part in the process. But he was determined to go and do the right thing and interview Marie, even though she was a girl. And everyone knew that a girl couldn't kill all those people. No, no, not a girl. A girl can't no. do anything like that. She's just too small and fragile and delicate. She's too dainty. He asked her about the man who did all the killing she never revealed his name or his location. She did reveal that he used a straight razor and drank the blood of his victims. You mean like a vampire? <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly what she meant. She also informed Michael that the first victim that was found wasn't actually the first victim at all. The first and second victims were Marie's mother and stepfather. She refused to give their names, but the interview had to stop there for the day. If she would just give the name of the blood drinker, all this would stop and no one would care about her anymore at all. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. <sighs> In between interviews with Marie, Percy was the only one who stuck with Michael. One day after school, they got in Percy's car for a drive and talked about girls and dances. And Percy nudged Michael's arm. Except he didn't. Both his arms were on the steering wheel. And a snake crawled out of a bag on the seat. <laughs> Yikes. They almost crashed in the school parking lot, and one of the officers, Bert, came running to help. He rescued the snake and took it home as a pet, and it's tiny and adorable. <laughs> but who would put a snake in Percy's car? Was it a prank or something worse? Surprisingly... The snake incident was forgotten for a while. Dude, how do you forget that there was a snake in your car? <laughs> there was a snake in my car, oh my she gosh. hears in Woody's voice. Pilsen continued badgering Michael and his father about the interviews. Michael did have to tell his dad about the blood drinking part because Pilsen found out and decided everything that Marie said was a lie. And it was all a waste of time. I hate that guy. It Jerk. Hate him. Sheriff Jensen was happy to keep the interviews going for as long as necessary because while they were going on, there were no more bloodless murders to deal with. Pilsen didn't care. Oh, Pilsen. He was even more intent on getting Marie to Nebraska and to the electric chair. He took Michael out to lunch one day and was absolutely awful oh, to him. Worst. It was horrible. It's the worst. He showed him pictures of all the victims. Really? Mm. Over milkshakes. <sighs> no, mm. no, those two things do not go mm -mm. together. And he also insinuated that Michael had something going on with Marie. No. And said if he didn't get a name, she was going to die. Oh, this guy. Oh, my gosh. Hit him. <sighs> Even if Michael didn't really believe the vampire stuff, he decided to investigate and borrowed a bunch of vampire books from the library. <laughs> I love it. 
and he also kind of started teasing Marie about it. She wouldn't relent, though. She told Michael that the blood drinker didn't always kill his victims. Sometimes he just fed. Then she showed off all the scars on her arms. She warned Michael not to go out alone. And when he asked why, should he be worried? Should his family? Marie didn't answer. Then Michael asked why the blood drinker left her on the night of the Carlson's murders. She revealed because he wanted her to get caught. <gasps> Ooh. Ooh. Later on, Michael and Percy spent some time in the woods behind Percy's house. This time, instead of talking about girls, they talked about vampires. It's a <laughs> reasonable like conversation. It sounds like if we were sitting in the it woods, does. what would we talk it about? It really does. What would we be talking about? Vampires. There's nothing no abnormal doubt. with this conversation. Nope. That's all. Well, then they got separated. Ooh. Oh, no. Michael wasn't worried. He practically grew up in those woods. But then he noticed something. A carving in a tree. A deep carving of a weird symbol. Michael told Percy that Marie said the blood drinker could still be in town, watching. Ugh. So they decided to search the woods for him. They followed footprints that didn't belong to either of them, but they did not find anyone. Michael told his dad and the guys at the station, but they didn't find anyone either. Ooh, spooky. Ew. Michael talked to Marie about it, and she revealed that the blood drinker was just showing off playing games that is unsettling do you not like one day after church michael and his mom went to visit the widow who lived nearby the carlsons and she said to michael that she saw stephen carlson the night he died taking them inside his house when michael asked who the them was the widow got confused and said it was just Stephen and his girlfriend. Again, unsettling. <laughs> Michael asked Marie about it, and then they started talking about why the blood drinker was able to kill people without causing a fuss. Why no one put up a fight. It turns out, some of the victims did fight, or try to run. But only because he let them. Because he liked oh. playing games. They argued a little after that about why Marie would go along with those games, why she didn't run away, and why the blood drinker didn't kill her. Because he protected her and told her that after they were finished, she'd never need to be protected again. To Michael, that sounded like a motive for murder, going along with killing people in exchange for eternal life. Michael stayed away from Marie for a while after that conversation. He spent some time talking to Nancy, the secretary at the jail, who also spent a lot of time with Marie. They talked about why no one seemed to put up a fight whilst being murdered, but she decided that maybe they didn't realise what was happening until it was too late. Like people judged Michael for his feelings for Marie, they judged Nancy too. She lost her daughter and husband in a fire years before and has moved on with her life. But the townsfolk couldn't handle that. The scandal. Oh, oh how dare you live your life. Oh, dare you have a life. How dare you try to move on. How dare you. You should have just burned up in the fire too. Exactly. It's shocking. Another scandal surfaced <laughs> soon after that. Remember how Michael forgot about the snake incident with Percy? Oh, yeah. After walking his sister, Dawn, home from school, they arrived at the front door to see a snake nailed there. Ugh. The same one. Ugh. No one in town fessed up to this ordeal, but does that mean that the blood drinker did it? Or mm. was it someone else? Michael went back to see Marie after that to ask why the blood drinker would mess with his family like that. She claimed to not know who did it, which just made Michael angrier. Everyone in this town was terrible to him and his family because of her. If she'd only tell him the truth. 
Later that night, Percy took Michael to a party. They spent the evening hanging out and drinking beers with boys from the football team that were friends with Steve Carlson. They decided to go to visit Stephen's grave, but when they got there, they did not celebrate Stephen's life. Instead, they threw beer cans at Michael and put a loaded gun in his <sighs> face. What the hell? Yes. They tried to kill him because of his connection to Marie. Before they could pull the trigger, though, one of the guys caught sight of something carved into the back of Stephen's headstone that freaked them out. It was more of the same symbols Michael and Percy saw carved into the trees. They reported the carvings to Sheriff Jensen, but not the attempted murder. Oh, my God. (sighs) What the hell? Oh, I hated that scene. Oh, I hated it it so much. Michael went back to interview Marie again after that encounter, and they talked more about the individual murders and got more details of each one. Sometimes the blood drinker would chase his victims. Other times, he wouldn't. One time in particular, he made his elderly victims see himself and Marie as their grandchildren. He made Marie shave the man and get them dressed for bed. Then he killed and drank them. Michael asked why Marie ever went with him in the first place. She revealed it was because everyone always told her she was a bad girl. Everyone but him. Mm. Poor Marie, my gosh. Yeah, that's probably one of the more revealing conversations about motivation and character. Also the one earlier where she was talking about how she wouldn't need to be protected anymore. Yes. The next time Michael tried to visit Marie, he had to wait. Mr. Pilsen's back. No. He came to tell Marie that he was taking her back to Nebraska soon. No. One of the victims left textbooks behind with things written inside, but the police didn't immediately put that together. He also discovered something else. Michael tried to stop Mr. Pilsen and told him that Marie is telling the truth. But of course Pilsen didn't believe that. Then he commented on how sometimes the tape-recorded interviews started in the middle of a conversation and how it was because they were talking about things of a delicate nature. Sexual things. Creep, you creep, you creep. They're children. Because Marie is 16 and pretty... No. Stop it. Just because she's 16 and just because she's pretty doesn't mean a thing. Stop it doesn't being mean anything. shitty. Ugh. Pilsen is a creep. Hate him! Well, then he left to go back to Nebraska after that. Good riddance. Fucking the stay afternoon. there. Jeez. Ugh, poor Nebraska. I feel sorry for it. Michael's dad asked him after this conversation if he wanted to stop interviewing Marie. But no, he can't. There's no way she could ever have killed anyone. While Pilsen was gone, Christmas came and went, and Michael's family gave Marie gifts. She said it was the nicest Christmas she ever had, which is so sad. Yeah. You know that that Christmas I had in prison for murder? Best Christmas Mm -hmm. ever. Best one. (sighs) Then, one night in January... Something weird happened. Michael heard tapping outside his window, like someone throwing pebbles. No, 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 no. He expected it to be Percy, but instead, it was the blood drinker. Oh, shit. (laughs) Standing in the street, throwing pebbles hard enough to chip Michael's window. He ran downstairs with a baseball bat to bash the guy in the street, But instead of being in the street, he was in the living room. Oh, shit. He told Michael to ask Marie how much blood she drank. And then he disappeared. Oh, my God. Oh, and his voice. Oh. Oh. His voice was good. It was. Okay. Brace yourself, people. Oh, no. Pilsen's Pilsen, back. Pilsen's back. 
Warning, <laughs> warning. He came back with some crushing information. He learned by listening to the tapes and putting together some context clues that Marie gave a fake last name and with this knowledge he discovered that her mother and stepfather were reported missing. We already know from previous chapters that they're dead, but Pilsen didn't know that. He also believed that Marie's stepfather was the man responsible for the murders and that he and Marie had a sexual relationship that she seduced him into. What the hell, man? What the hell? What evidence have you got for that? Oh my God, You're just jumping it. to conclusions oh, because you're a creepy perv. Oh, I hate it. But I do love what Michael's dad said in this case. When Pilsen's like, oh yeah, she is seducing her stepfather. And he's like, uh, when a stepfather and a stepchild are, when they're involved like that, uh, that ain't a good thing. We don't, we don't consider that a relationship. Yeah. Ugh, Pilsen, ugh, ugh. Please. No. He's vomiting juice and he's horrible. Ugh. So Pilsen said that with this information, that Nebraska has the better claim on her and he's taking her back. And he told all the newspapers. Oh. Ass hat. God, I can't stand it. After the story was released, Michael was pretty much tortured by reporters, but no comment. No comment. Excellent. He never commented. Well done. He did go to see Marie to check on her and see why it would be so bad if all the murders were pinned on her stepfather. She'd just need to tell Pilsen where he was. Of course, she wouldn't tell Pilsen anything, but she would tell Michael. She finally revealed to him the location of her mother and stepfather's bodies. And he went along with Pilsen and the police and FBI to locate them. However, when they arrived at the house and pulled up the floorboards in the basement, Marie's mother was there and another woman who owned the house, but not the stepfather. Who could have moved his body? Marie was sure he was dead and under those floorboards. Michael talked to Pilsen about it and asked, why he released the information to the papers, because surely that would have inspired the actual blood drinker to go there and further set Marie up for all the murders. Well, Pilsen didn't care about any of that. He didn't care about the truth at all. (sighs) Michael couldn't take it. He knew Marie didn't kill anyone and didn't deserve to die. So he snuck out of his house and had planned to break her out. Nancy was there, sitting with Marie, since they didn't have much time left together, and she was just going to let them go without a fight at all. But Marie refused to go. She told Michael one last bit of information. She told him about what happened the night the Carlsons were murdered, and why she was covered in blood. (sighs) Marie and the blood drinker met Steve Carlson on the road and went with him into their house. Everything was perfectly fine. Steve's mom started making a pie, and they sat together and chatted. The blood drinker told Marie she had to be the one to kill them. But when she realized there was a baby, she didn't want to do it anymore. But she had to. The blood drinker forced her to. She started with Steve, but couldn't do it. So... She moved to his father. She slit his throat and began to drink. But she couldn't stomach it. The blood drinker had to help. And then he killed the mother. When it was time to kill Steve, Marie refused and forced herself to vomit up the blood she drank. It covered her from head to toe. She told Steve to take the baby and run. But he wouldn't. Then she told the blood drinker to just kill her and leave her behind. But he wouldn't. He killed Steve and left the baby and Marie behind. Michael was so shocked that Marie really did kill someone. Yeah. Oh. Soon after that, Marie was charged with the murder of her mother, Audrey Cordy. That's the only one she was charged with. But Michael heard someone say, you could only electrocute her once. 
So it didn't matter as long as she was dead. But she wasn't sent to the electric chair. She requested hanging. After the trial and the hanging, everyone pretty much forgot about the search for Marie's stepfather. They forgot about the blood drinking and the symbols carved and the missing blood and the man in Michael's living room and the snake stuff and just everything. After the hanging, Michael received a letter from Marie asking him to go to Nebraska to dig up her corpse and burn her heart. He got Percy to give him a lift and together they dug her up. The story ends with Michael lifting the lid of the coffin, begging Marie to come back. Such a good story. Oh my god. Got chills. Got chills from it. And question mark. Oh. Right, we're going to go and have a conversation in the woods about vampires. Yes. Me back after this. Yes. <sighs> have you ever wondered what Tina Fey has in common with Jonathan Swift? Or how Star Wars is connected to feudal Japan? Or just how pervasive Shakespeare's influence still is? I'm Rhonda. And I'm Erin. And our show Pop DNA explores the literary and historical roots of your favorite pop culture works. Like the Greek mythology and early 20th century feminism echoed in the film Wonder Woman. Or the classic dystopian fiction and real-life political revolutions that informed the Hunger Games. Every month, we bring you a deep-dive discussion of a selected pop culture work. Featuring jokes no one will think are funny and literary references no one asked for. Find us at thepopdna.blog or anywhere you get your podcasts. By the way, Shakespeare is bigger than Disney. I really love this story. I, I, uh, yeah, it was really well done. Like, wow. I loved it. Do you know what? I think actually this story is better with multiple reads. Yeah. Yeah, I read, I've read it three times. I've read it three times now. I can't. I think it's one of these where you get the surface information and you like, whoa, okay. And there might be some dissatisfaction. I was reading some reviews and certain people were mentioning some things that weren't particularly happy about resolution. You know, it, it was very open-ended. People don't like open-ended stories. I like them. I quite Ooh, enjoy this. me too. Yes, same. We, but we, we, we have said on previous occasions we like it because we like to create our own ending. Yeah. So we're, we're quite happy with that. Um, but, you know, that's some of the reviews that I had heard. But... And that Michael was told nothing. Marie told Michael nothing. And now can, from from one read, I can kind of understand where people may be coming from. But after multiple reads, or listens, or both, I think you start to realise there's like nuances to the way it's being done. And it's like the snake. You might forget things, and then all of a sudden the piece of information comes back. Yeah. So I think with multiple reads, it kind of builds up, and builds up until you go, actually, this is a very smart book yeah and because it's a smart book no offense to anybody but it may put people off it yeah it's very well done very clever yeah. two thumbs way way up slow golf clap yeah Kandara. i think i think my favorite thing about it is you don't you don't actually know what happened no one knows no. No one knows what happened. So you can decide for yourself, like, are is there even a vampire? Are vampires even real? Yeah. Was it the stepdad? Was it yeah. Marie on her own? Why did she have cuts all over her arms? Was she just self-harming? Was she abused by her stepfather and she ran away? Or is there really a vampire? The other thought, I thought perhaps this is somebody who kind of, quote unquote, rescued her from an abusive situation mm-hmm. um, because you know when she says this in prison this is the best Christmas she's ever had and you just think oh my god that's terrible mm. that's so sad so you kind of think well what was the relationship with her mum and her stepfather Yeah, I'm not being Pilsen I'm not automatically saying there was anything sexual it just meant being neglectful Yeah, um, which is bad in itself um, but we don't know what that relationship was and we don't know who who the 
the blood drinker is, it could be any somebody completely unrelated and they could be her quote unquote rescuer. Yeah. I just I I I, I hate it because I would like some concrete information. I want I want to know in Kondara's head the resolution, how she sees it. I want to know hers. And that for me would be canon. But then this is the kind of material where you could just bring up so many variations in your own fanfic and each one would be the same. It's like it's like the, the Joker, DC's The Joker. Mm-hmm. You don't actually know his true origin story. And when they have released The Joker's origin story, they've released three at the same time. And it's like, pick one. And that's it with this book. It's like the Joker's origin story. It's pick one. Pick what you want to believe. Pick whatever makes you happy or unhappy or frustrates you the least, whatever. Frustrates you the most. You. Or frustrates <laughs> you the most. Exactly. But it's up to you. I love it. And it's great. I really like that concept. I really do. Because it puts the reader in the creative seat now. Yeah. In my mind... There is a vampire, because you know how we feel about vampires. Of course, there has to be a vampire. Has to be, I'm 100%. I really, really liked the scene where he was in their house. Oh my god, that was so creepy. Right? mm. Because Michael, he grabs his bat and he's like, okay, um, this guy's here, he's real, and I'm going to go bash him to death. And then he runs downstairs like it couldn't have been five seconds. And I was downstairs and then he was in my living room. And then you find out later that his poor little sister Dawn, like before the snake was nailed to the door, saw this guy outside and was like, oh, he looked like he needed to come in and have a drink. So I made him a coffee. I just invited Dawn, him in. Man. I invited him into Dawn, our house. Right. Do not There's invite strangers things. into your house. But this was the 50s. So it's different. You don't invite anybody into your house. We've seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer the movie. You do not invite your friend into the house, especially when they're floating off the ground on the first floor. Look, we're not talking about Buffy yet. We're not. Can we please wait until Kandara's next book comes out? That's true, but it was vampire adjacent. (laughs) I just love it. Yeah. In my dawn, man. In my dawn is lovely, but geez, what you what? Yeah. Don't. Don't invite a stranger in. No. But in my head, the vampire is real. And Mm -hmm. do you remember that scene after Michael is held at gunpoint? You know, they're going to shoot him. His friends are going to shoot him in the head. Um, Which... Friends, yeah. Yeah, which just, like, gives me chills. But after that scene, I expected something bad to happen to those guys because yes. Marie was just standing there like staring out the window chanting their names over and over and over again I thought oh my god she's got some psychic connection to the blood drinker and they're gonna turn up dead but it didn't happen I thought, I thought the blood drinker was gonna be like underneath the window or something listening in yeah and then he was gonna yeah. go and murder them and you know gonna yeah. he's gonna keep Michael safe nope yeah no nope. no no I mean, you know, the the blood drinker could have done us a solid at that one. He really could have. You know what really would have been good? If he had killed Pilsen. 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 Oh, my God. The worst. Just rage. Burning the rage. Worst. Every time. The worst. Every time. The worst. <sighs> guy, he's the just, worst. The guy was... It was awful. He was just awful. But then he doesn't want justice. He doesn't want truth. You think... I mean, he, he, he gives the... The sure of wanting truth because he wants Marie to be charged for the murders, but he's got no proof, no evidence, no motivation, barely anything to link her to any place. What was it, a couple of footprints or something? But this is the 50s. Did they even have DNA testing back then? Mm-mm. So there's nothing. It's it's theoretical, Her her part in the murders. But he's like, no, no, she's gonna get charged. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get her. She's gonna go capital punishment. And it's like, what? She's fifteen, sixteen at the time. 
you're killing a child. Yeah. I mean, regardless of them being an actual murderer, because children can be killers. You're still killing a child. Yeah. And it might just be, like, I don't know, like, your state slash personal thoughts on capital punishment, but it's just not a thing in the UK. We don't do it. I don't think, I think the 50s was actually probably the last time anything like that was done before it was outlawed. But it's like, you rehabilitate. I mean, some people cannot be rehabilitated. I will grant you that. But not, it's a child. They need help. Yeah. I think... If they are the murderer or accomplice. I think that Pilsen just wanted this case. He just wanted to win for notoriety. Yeah. It's all politics. Yeah. That's all it is. But how perverted is he as well Ew. he's constantly sexualizing the child marie Ew. and it's not even inferring he's outright saying how she's basically seducing everybody that marie and michael have a sexual relationship that's why the tapes keep cutting out and there's just innuendo all over and it's like yeah. um, stop it yeah, she's a child I Stop love it. every single time that he says anything like that when Michael's dad is around. He's like, yeah, she's a kid. She, she's a child. She's 15. Oh, well, she's 16 in a month. <sighs> what does that matter? She's a baby. Stop it. It's awful. It's horrible. And it, I'm so glad that Michael's dad did, you know, tell him they like call them for it and especially when it was like well she obviously seduced the stepfather really really a child did no, no 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 the grown ass adult with common sense known legalities known ethics and morals mm. knows if there was anything there it was the adult she, oh god that guy oh man and you messaged me and said, listen to the audiobook. I'm obsessed <laughs> with the audiobook. And the voice is completely obscure. Now, I'm sure it was, um, I looked it up. Was it Roy Brocksmith? He played Dr. Edgemar in Total Recall. I think The so. Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> that is, I'm sorry, that is exactly the voice that Matt Godfrey used. And it was... So perfect for a weaselly, <laughs> slimy guy. And it's so funny because, like, he's described as, you know, he's like six feet tall and he's got a, you know, black hair and a perfect haircut and a sharp suit. But man, it's not, it's not any voice other than the guy from Total Recall. <laughs> I couldn't picture him in any other way as well. After you told me that, and I was like, okay. And I listened to the audiobook. I was like, oh, God, it is him. And no, you could tell me what the description is for Pilsen every single time I hear that voice. And I will not I will not picture it. I will picture the guy from Total Recall. Yeah, just like <laughs> flop sweat, just disgusting. Yeah. Jowl yeah. as well. Yeah. Floppy jowl. Yeah. Yeah, and you can, you can imagine just going red face and steam coming out of his ears when he gets mad and yes. frantic with energy. And, and yeah, it was just, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect. I really enjoyed it. And he did, um, the, the the narrator as well, was it Matt? Matt Godfrey. Godfrey? Yeah. Uh, can you tell? I know his, his name immediately now. I don't even have to you think about it. You probably know his personal address as well, which is not creepy at all. Um, he did Michael's voice so well. Um he really he did that 17 year old mm -hmm. you know adolescent not ad well i say adolescent young man's voice yeah. so well it was so clear and it was so well done no i really rate him as a, as a narrator yeah. he was excellent i really enjoyed it now so yeah he's going on the stalker list yeah so you know how sorry not sorry <laughs> everyone knows how much i like kendara blake right and that she's mm -hmm. a friend of the show and that I've gone out to lunch with her and that like I send her messages sometimes and I sent her a message after listening to this book and I was like oh my god the narration is perfect and she hadn't heard it 
Really? Yeah, and she was like, oh my God, tell me about it. Is it good? Like, how did... Like, I know it was a, a male who did it. Did he... How was he with Marie's voice? Like, oh, it was perfect. It was perfect. Mm. Because she was, like... It wasn't too girly. It wasn't, like, high-pitched and whiny and, like, it, it was It wasn't just... breathy. Mm. Oh, I hear breathy female yeah, voices. Yeah, but no, it was perfect. He did a perfect female voice. And yeah. the voice of the blood drinker was, like, all garbled and scary and deep and weird and, oh, it was so good. <laughs> he he did an absolutely it's like he was, stellar job. It's like he was... Instead of expelling air when he was the blood drinker, he was breathing air in. <gasps> I kind of got like Ask her. asthmatic kind of. Yeah, it's you know, like, somebody who's had an, they've had an asthma attack. Yeah, it, it was inward breathing. Ask her about the blood. Like, ah, stop it! It's so scary. <laughs> yeah. It was wrong. It was deeply wrong. Like, take a breathy voice and reverse it. And then, yeah, I, I got like, which is why I was wondering if he's not a vampire, could it be a person who has chest issues? He's just a smoker. Do, he's just a smoker. <laughs> just... Um, but, then, but then, what made me also think was the story about, you know, the tuberculosis victim. Uh huh. Um, well, tuberculosis is, can attack your lungs. And I was like, could it be the brother? <laughs> no, because he died. Because he died of tuberculosis after eating his sister's heart. Oh! He ate, his sis- he ate his sister's heart, but who's not to say he didn't come back as a vampire? <sighs> he could have. And, you know, he has unfortunate long-term effects from... His living life and has respiratory issues now. They they did. They were very I careful. They were very careful to mention that you know they desecrated her body, but the brother's body was fine. Yeah. So maybe exactly. you're right. So maybe he didn't die. Maybe he undied, and then just continued growing up with tuberculosis. <laughs> And he can't die because he's a vampire. So the tuberculosis just keeps eating his insides out. <laughs> he's just, just, just sucks he's to just, be him. He's just walking tuberculosis. He's just walking tuberculosis. <laughs> you know, I was so I was thinking, like this episode is going to be really short because, like, the story's not that long, and it's so moving and all. Like, there's it, there's not going to be anything that we're going to latch onto and crack up about. But well, he's walking tuberculosis, so job well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so good. I love it. Can I just point out? I've just been stalking Matt Godfrey and. He's got a lovely nerdy look about him. Does he? I haven't I haven't looked into him. Oh, I have to screen share right now. Oh god. I'm on his website. Sorry, Matt Godfrey. Sorry I'm already. His... <laughs> it's gonna turn into another Steve West. It is. Sorry. Mm. So who could the the blood drinker be. So we've got walking tuberculosis, dude. He's definitely walking tuberculosis, dude. He is def- definitely. Yeah. You know, there were a couple of times where I thought that it might be Pilsen. Because he was just oh. so... Because he was... Like, he really, really wanted her to die. And there were all those times where he would come into the cell and she would just start screaming at him. <laughs> so I thought, wouldn't it be so cool if he was the blood drinker? But then I just hate him so much, and I don't want him to even be able to be a vampire because he doesn't deserve it. No, he doesn't deserve vampirism at Mm-mm. all. I, I love the fact that, like, within two minutes of meeting Pilsen, not even two minutes, within two seconds, she's screaming and screeching and swearing and cursing at him, and it's like, yeah, yeah, he brings out the absolute worst in people. Yeah, it's, and everybody's just like, oh, it's Pilsen, oh. Ugh. Yeah, he's the worst. Yeah. He's the worst. Yeah. I'm, I am still curious about Marie, though. Have you decided, is she a vampire? Is she a scapegoat? Is she a Renfield accomplice type person? You know, 
what is she? Who is she? Did she commit that murder? Did she help with the death of her mother and stepfather? What happened to the stepfather's body? I think that Michael was right. That when Pilsen released this information to the papers, that the blood drinker went back and moved that body and yes, got the stepfather out of there. But I hated that Marie really, really wanted to see if her stepfather's body was there. And, like, hey, make sure that he's still full of blood, okay? Because I don't, like, he was just murdered. And, and, I, and I hate that. I hate that because, like, now he's not even there. And so she'll never know. She'll never know what happened to him. Yeah. And it's rough. Yeah. Um, but I really think that he went, that the blood drinker went back and moved his body. I agree. Because Pilsen was just too out for the, for the, the win, the credit. Yeah. To find the killer. And I mean, it's, it's what, I mean, because it's the fifties, you can kind of blame it on the era that, they know no better now you would not get any of that information released to the press no at all no um it would interfere too much i mean how how would you get a conviction based on oh we've given all the information and it's in public domain you couldn't you couldn't get an unbiased jury uh so yeah um i agree with that i don't think the stepfather got turned i definitely think he's dead yeah I like to think that the blood drinker is either tuberculosis guy, who's my number one suspect, uh-huh, yeah. but just something completely unrelated. I like the fact, I like the idea it's tied into this. Well, they thought the sister was a vampire. Well, and they fed the brother the heart, but actually, he was already, he was the vampire, really. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my theory. I hope that she's um, a vampire at the end. I want her to be a vampire at the end. But she doesn't. I know. But, you know, Michael goes to dig her up. And she tells him, you know, you have, you have to come and dig me up. You have to cut out my heart. But I want, I want her to be a vampire at the end. I want Michael to have dug her up. And she sees that he's there. And then it's like a magical love story. And this is the only time I ever want there to be a love story to happen because vampires are involved. But I think that it would be a nice ending for Marie. And she deserves a good ending. Uh, Yeah. But I also really do love that she died at the end. It's like, oh, it's it's a book where the main character dies? Yes! Yes. I love it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't chapter one, I'll grant you that, but they did die. So yes, I do like that. I do want to know what happens with Michael, though. I'm really curious because he gives up going for journalism. Like, this this completely ruins him for that. So, I mean, does he become a vampire hunter? A vamp- okay, here a you go. Vampire, here you go. Hunter. Here you go. Marie comes back as a vampire. Michael turns into a vampire hunter and it's this buffy angel slash spike romance that takes place vampire hunter meets vampire and they go around the world trying to find the blood drinker to get revenge could be good there you go go. so who was your favorite character i really liked percy I thought he was a great friend. Yes. I really liked Nancy. Oh, yes. And I also really liked Michael's dad. Yes. I liked Michael's dad because he took no shit and put pills in his place. Yeah. 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 Very much appreciated that. I really I really appreciated Percy um, believing Michael and going, I mean, whether he actually believed in the whole vampire stuff or not. It doesn't matter because he supported his friend. And he believed yes. what Michael was telling him. Like, he believed that Michael believed it was true. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I really I really liked Percy. 
I think enough creepy things happen to Percy, unexplainable things happen to Percy for him to to question what's going on. And I would really like the story told from Percy's point of view. I'd like to see what like Percy's perceptions of like what what is actually going on in Percy's head while he's saying to his friend, you know, I believe you, I'm there, you know, let's do this, let's go search the woods, let's go and do this, let's go and, go and do that. We'll not take the duck dogs because they're pathetic and useless. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I would like to, I'd like, I'd like, I'd be interested in Percy's point of view. I really would. My favourite was Nancy as, like, yeah. as well. Yeah, I really liked She's Nancy. She's just, she was just such a nice character and she just wanted to take care of people. And she had such a sad backstory and I felt so sorry because she just she wants to move on with her life and needs to move on with her life but people reject her for that and that's awful yeah and that's another frustrating thing actually about the story it's like they can't do that that's a female a female can't do this i know it's the 50s but misogynist attitudes Perver- per- like still pervasive now. Yeah, can't be done. It's a woman. I yeah woman. that that did get on my nerves a little bit. But then I did I like they're like well she can never kill anyone. She's just a little girl. And she's like well I actually I did kill people. So womp <laughs> womp <laughs> shrug. <laughs> exactly. Girls can murder too. Yeah. Girls can be murderers too. Girls, you can do anything you want, including. Cut throats with a, a straight razor. Yep, and drink all the blood, and then vomit it all over yourself. <laughs> I really hope that I'm able to do, but character costly for this one because I just really, really want to do a very slow, like over the shoulder shot, turning around. And then just going, vomiting blood everywhere. <laughs> but I don't know if I can hold that much liquid in my mouth without gagging. You, you what you need is um, like a pump. You need a, a. I need one of those wire. One of those comedy vomit tubes and just yeah. So you can just pump, pump, pump it out. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I I do question how much blood can a person drink like how much liquid can a person drink to then be covered from head to foot in blood especially considering the blood drinker helped her drink the dad and he did the mother and killed Stephen Carlson she's covering a lot of blood for probably not drinking too much can I just this confused me can I just tell you that you remember that time remember remember that time I did the cosplay and I was covered in blood yeah I mean that that's more than one. Right, but remember that one? Remember that one where I was covered like my whole yes. head was covered in blood. That was I, I don't know how big the bottle was. I mean, I'm gesturing with my hands here. The bottle was this. That was only like shampoo bottle size. That was only this much poured over. So I don't think I don't think it's I don't think it would take that much. How do you vomit into your hair like that? I really think that she just did it in the creepiest possible way. And she just stood there and just went, and, you know, with her head back. And it just goes, yeah. Make sure you uh, join our Patreon bonus tier for that image. That was gorgeous. But I think that's what happened. You know, I'll just have to test it out. Just have to see what happens. gonna need another sign that says this is not real blood yeah yeah i'm just glad that this apartment that we currently live in doesn't have carpet <laughs> i can't ruin anything in here you need to go and do it in the pool i do i do <laughs> all right uh were you surprised by anything that they gave Marie the death penalty and hung her at the age of 16. Like, what the hell? Yeah. You've, you've murdered a child. I mean, yeah, she's a child. She's a murderer herself. Because, you know, according to her, 
her, her, her, in her own words, she did. There's no evidence, technically, I think, to prove it. And what's the worst thing is that she was charged for killing her mother. That's the one that got her because of the Nebraska accomplice law thing. That's what they got yeah. her for. Yeah. And again, what's the evidence? Because a mother's been in the ground for a year. You don't have the forensic pathology that you have now. I don't know. So Pilsen is... Pilsen's the kind of guy who would fabricate evidence. Yeah, he definitely Let's is. Just say. And also, I mean... But that, yeah, I'm, I was quite surprised there by were that. Those, you know, there were stories on the tapes of her saying, like, you know, kind of... Almost asking the blood drinker, you know, to take her away, to help to help her, to get rid of her parents, to get rid of her stepfather so she could get out of there. So, yeah, but, I, I mean, I don't know what the laws were back then or in that state slash country, but you can freely admit to a crime, but unless there's evidence to prove that you did it, you can't be convicted of it. Well, this is so the you 50s. Could, you could, well, exactly. I mean, you could admit to the cows come home, I did this, I did this, I, it was me. But unless there's evidence... We'll have to investigate 1950s laws in Nebraska. Any of the listeners know, because frankly, I'm too lazy to do that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> what surprises for you, though? I mean, really, just that Pilsen was just literally oh. the worst human being ever. Oh, and God. And really, really, though, truly, I'm surprised by two things. One, that, like, no one actually cared what really happened at all. And there were the people in the neighborhood who were like, hey, get on with this interview because, you know, let's throw her in the chair and get back to what we were doing. Yeah. Hate. Hate that. Like, why why don't they care about this sweet, precious girl in, in the prison? <laughs> So that's surprising to me, that no one actually cares about, like, really the truth that happened. And even people like Nancy and, and Michael's mom weren't really that interested in the truth because they wanted to just take... They were the opposite. They wanted to take care of Marie. Yeah. So like, Nancy was free, going to let her escape. Yeah. I loved that scene where Michael, he shows up at the prison and he's got, like, his dad's car keys and he's got a backpack full of stuff. And he's like, come on. And, you know, he doesn't expect Nancy to be sitting there like, holding Marie's hands. And she's like, oh, you're here. You're going to go? And he's like, yeah. Do I need to tie you up? And she's like, nah. Just go. Ooh. Other thing that kept happening all the way through, Marie was like, have you got any smokes? And Michael constantly didn't have any smokes for her. Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry. Forgot again. Sorry. <laughs> But then Nancy was there, and Nancy was giving her smokes all the time, so it was fine. <laughs> you know, it could have been if if she was a vampire, maybe she was trying to test her mind control abilities. Hey, bring me, bring me smokes, bring me smokes, and he's like, "Yeah, sure, I will." And then he forgot when he was out of, you know, when he was out of her range. Transfer range. Yeah. <laughs> Corn of influence. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's that. Maybe that's why. Um. I was also really surprised by Kendara's storytelling because Kendara uh -huh. Blake is the master of last chapter surprise, like deaths or something terrible happens at the very, very end of the book. That didn't really happen in this one. I was very pleased with the ending and I didn't go, what? Oh my God. Like I normally do at the end of her books. So I was surprised by that. Like, it was just a really good story from beginning to end. <laughs> I like the idea as well. As, as well, I mean, as much as I want to know more, I'm quite happy with just one. It's nice to have a standalone I for a do change. love a standalone. I love a standalone with a male narrator. It's my favorites. Don't yes. get them very often. It's very good. I love yeah, this book. I enjoyed it. It was, it was like I said, I think... I enjoyed it the first time round, but I would give it more stars second time round and probably more stars on Goodreads a third time round because you pick up more. Yeah. 
and yeah, it's definitely one that you can reread quite happily. And it does because it doesn't matter that you know Marie dies at the end. No, it I mean you know matter. you know within the first few chapters really because they're like as soon as Pilsen shows up and he's like, yeah, we're gonna put her in the chair, and then the last line of that chapter is, well, the joke's on him. She didn't ask to be electrocuted. She has to be hanged. So you know that she's dead already. That was something exactly. else that I liked about the writing because it was, you know, telling the story. And then it would, like, shoot into the future and then come back. You know, like, well, he didn't know this at the time, but this happened. Mm-hmm. I really liked that. Yeah, I like there was no surprises. There's no spoilers. Nope. Of course, unless you've not read it at all and you've just listened to the podcast. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. I really, like, it gave me uh, Salem's Lot vibes. Mm. Okay. Because, I mean, that's that's a really, that's, that's a really long story with vampires mm-hmm. that move into a town and, like, slowly take things over. And it's just like a slow burn with these vampires the whole time. And that's kind of how I felt about this one, but just like in a tighter package. It was more of a psychological takeover. Yeah, because, I mean, Stephen King writes way too many words. <laughs> this is like, it's, it's, a, it's a really good story told in as many words as it needs to be told in. <laughs> This What's one. the word limit? I will hit that and then. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah, but but Stephen King is like, well, I will tell this story in one billion billion words. <laughs> and Kandara's like, no, I can do it better. I can do it better. I can do it in fewer words. And she does. <laughs> and yeah, she it's a relatively quick read, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You could easily finish this in a night. If you listen, if you sat down and just. If you listen to the audiobook at high speed. Like we do. <clears throat> it's just I just got you. Just got to know what happens next. I'll tell you what's going to happen next. Would you rather? Would you rather? <laughs> We're so excited because we are joined by Kendara Blake. Yay! 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 Would you rather? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Right, so we asked our listeners, would you rather interview a vampire or interview a vampire's accomplice? And yeah, everybody's vampire. <laughs> On Facebook, yeah. it was 86% vampire. Instagram was 92% vampire. Twitter was 75% vampire. And TikTok was 88% vampire. So everybody wants to interview the vampire. And mm-hmm. Brie Tart on Instagram said, interview the vampire. Best to get the story from the source, even if I'm more likely to become a new thrall or die from the encounter. L20Cav on Instagram said, for me, it would be the vampire. There's too many different variations on vampire mythology, so I'd like to get the standard questions settled once and for all. Garlic, mirrors, holy water, etc. But I'd also ask the really important questions that no one seems to ever ask, like, what color is their urine, and do they still poop? (laughs) (laughs) It's a good question. Jess Finch Mills on Instagram says, Accomplice. Basically, I just want to hang out with Gilmero from what we do in the shadows. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob on Facebook said, Accomplice, the actual vampire could glamour me, but someone like Renfield would accidentally tell me everything while eating raspberries off the ground. (laughs) It was a raspberry. It was a raspberry. I swear it was a raspberry. (laughs) And Colin on Facebook said, Oh, definitely the accomplice. Less chance of having my neck nibbled on. Dribbled on, not so much. Plus, I get to bribe poor old Renfield with nice juicy spiders to get what I need instead of virgin's blood, which is tricky to get at the best of times. I see no lie. I'm glad glad they both went Dracula dead and loving at Renfield. (laughs) He is the superior Renfield of all Renfields, to be fair. Yeah, definitely. Finally, Dakota on Facebook said, Vampire! Isn't the answer always vampire? And then on TikTok, she also said, Vampire, always vampire. Dakota knows us. Yes. She knows our answer is always vampire. 
But what is it this time? Mmm. Who's going to go first? Guest always goes first. So just who would I rather interview, the vampire or the accomplice? Yeah, yeah, it's Mm -hmm. got to be a vampire. I feel like Anne Rice set that standard. You want to interview the vampire. That's... There's, yeah, there's a whole book about that's the it. Whole, that's the whole thing. I don't know if I'd have the the balls to be so intrusive about the poops um, on the first meeting. <laughs> that might be like a year later check in with the vampire and then we could finally cover, mm-hmm. you know, the poops. Because that's got to be unpleasant. <laughs> You're just eating blood. So <laughs> it can't be nice, you know. It's got to be real. No. No. Liquidy yeah. and tarry is That's what I That's got to be a situation. Like, yeah. I, I, baby's first poop. Mm. It's like, That's what mm. I thought of. It's baby's first yeah. poop. It's getting rid of all the ick and the gore and the disgusting stuff. And, you know, reject the body's rejecting, like, you know, the bits of hair and stuff that get into your mouth automatically. And, yeah, it's... It's like baby's first. Poop. I think it should be like the vampire code. I thought about this. To one. always lie about that and just say they're like Kim Jong Un, and they're just so efficient that they never produce any waste. Because thinking about vampire poop <laughs> just really destroys the whole mystique, you know. It really yeah. does. It really ruins everything. Yeah, you can't imagine Angel going to the the, the pooper, can you? It's yeah. like you know. But if he did, he would use a. Bidet. He would, maybe not correctly. But yeah. he'd use it. And no. but maybe that's why like they're always, you know, disappearing all of a sudden. Like whoosh. It's because they have to go now. That would be so efficient. It's an emergency bathroom situation. Just don't explain yourself because you're a vampire and you just keep it it's part of the mystique. It's like I'll turn mm-hmm. into mist, go and use the facilities, yeah. and then uh-huh. whoosh, come back. It's like ah oh, blah. We had a similar conversation in our as an aside to our last episode. That is right. That's right. Um, our super fan Constance tried to trick us, and she asked us a "Would you rather" question, trying to get us to not answer vampire. And she asked us, "Would we rather be a vampire, but we have like emergency, random emergency diarrhea at least once a week, or would we rather be a human with superpowers?" And we still both chose vampire. Because we decided, you know, we could turn into mist and then we could just mist poop everywhere or we could turn into wolves. Claire, you said you could turn into a wolf. I wanted to turn into a bat and basically, you know, poop on people's heads because it's funny. Yeah. Why not? Sorry. If there's comedic value in it, I'm going I just had like... And this is vampire with comedic value. Yeah, I just had like a mental image of like the Claire bat just like screaming as she flies and just crop dust people with her emergency diarrhea. (laughs) I wish I had my bat with me right now because I would just scream bat and then suddenly yep just be a bat yeah yeah there's now you know if I scream bat that's what's gonna happen (laughs) oh oh, gosh oh no oh no okay so Claire are you interviewing the vampire of course I am this is a silly question why are we even asking this to each other of course I'm interviewing the vampire and the last question will be would you prefer neck or wrist you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, which do you... Yeah. Would you rather to the vampire at the very end? <laughs> yes. We have to force the vampire to play would you rather. And then we can ask them about emergency poops and which one they would rather have. Exactly. It's amazing what can be, sorry for the pun, stimulated via the comments. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> okay. Next question. Would you rather get hit in the head with a full can of beer or almost be shot in the head by a police officer? I think I have been hit in the head with a full can of beer and it's not that bad. So, you know, as long as it's not like a full on, as long as it's a glancing blow, it's okay. So yeah, the beer for sure. The cops with the guns is a no, 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 very scary. What about if it was, what if, this question should really be, would you rather be almost be shot in the head by your friend or almost be shot in the head by a police officer? I mean, technically both things happened to Michael over the course of the book. So, yeah. No. Poor Michael. Yeah, no, no. Anytime that the gun is involved, I'm I'm out. I'm just, 
I'm out. Just throw beer at me all day long. I don't care, but mm -mm, no guns. Mm -mm. I agree. I don't want to be anywhere near guns. And I love the cop. Did I get you? Did I get no! you? No! What? <laughs> no! Yeah. We've said before, guns are a completely foreign concept to me. Like, hello, UK police do not carry. So... However, you know, I've been to, like, Foo Fighter concerts and beer has gone every... Well, we, we assume it's beer. We like to think it's beer. Um, has been thrown around quite liberally. So, you know, whatever. But it like a full be. can? It might be a stubby. It's you smashed you have stubbies the in the can. US. Well, you can, if you, no, if it's a stubby. Do you not have stubbies? I don't, I don't know what a stubby so is. So a full can of B is like a full can, quite tall and large, isn't it? But a stubby is just like a tiny can. Oh, and just tiny I think our bit. normal cans are like in the middle. Because like you have... Sounds like you're like yeah. describing the silver bullet, you know, like the big, the big one. It's almost like a standard yeah. soda can size. No, oh no, we we ours are always mm. bigger. I was like probably double. If you put two soda cans on top of each other, that'll be your standard size. Oh yeah. Ish. And then a stubby will be a little bit smaller than um, a soda can. Hmm. Mm. And sometimes they get called tinnies. And they go, oh, do you want to go for a tinny? And you're like, oh, God, that's awful. I hate the term tinny. No, I don't want to. I don't want to go for a tinny. I don't like that. I mm -hmm. don't like beer slash lager from a can. I think it tastes yeah. weird. Draft pull or a bottle, please. Preferably yeah, but we're not talking about drinking. Lime. Yeah, just, we're not talking it's about just drinking them. Hit in the head Damn and it. no to a bottle. I mean, that's a big no. <laughs> that could kill you. Bad. But I think it can. No, I don't want a bottle. I don't want a bottle of beer thrown at my head. That's bad. I don't. I don't really want anything Absolutely. thrown at my head. Yeah, but, but it's I'd better, rather. It's better to have a can of beer than it is to have a bullet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and could you imagine, like, just being that close to a gun? It would be so loud and... Mm. I don't like anything about it. Mm -mm. It also depends on how good an arm the person who's throwing the beer can is. Like, do they have well, a these are fo throw? football and baseball bros, so... But they, they are, are drinking. drinking as yeah, well. Yeah, so they're kind of, like, rubbery at that point. <laughs> mm. Oh... I Whatever think if you've is. got a sibling as well, you're kind of used to things being chucked at your head, so you could probably take a can of beer quite easily. If you've got a sibling, it's happened, so you know you've probably already got the built-in protection. You know how to like bob and weave. Yeah, it's probably exactly yeah. zigzag, zigzag, yeah. zigzag. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably easier to like block a block a beer than it is to block a bullet. Well, yeah, you, you know, if you do that, you're going to just get a bullet yeah, in your arm, aren't you? I'd rather have a bullet in my arm than a bullet in my head, though. Well, that's true. That is true. <laughs> but we're yeah. fine. We we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. The worst thing that's happened, we got covered in some yeah, sticky we all beer. Here. We're all so... fine. Exactly. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Next question. Would you rather find the carvings in the trees or in the cemetery? Some serious, like, Blair Witch Carvings vibes. Carvings in the trees would like. be cooler. Like, they would freak me out more. So, it depend on my mood. If I wanted to be scared, I would go carvings in the trees. Because that sounded really, really freaky. When I was writing that scene, I thought it was pretty scary. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And following footprints that don't belong to them and seeing the carvings. And they're like, that's really, really deep carvings. <laughs> If you find carvings or effigies in the forest, you GTFO the forest. Fact. Because yeah. there's some Blair Witch shit going on right there and you need to get out, save yourself, abandon all friends. You know, pirate rules. I feel like it's scarier too because they're like up really high and they're all over the place. Whereas at, in the cemetery, you know, they're just on the back of the headstone. So that could easily be almost graffiti, except for the fact that it's <laughs> carved into stone. But the trees, them being all over the place, like just imagine you see one and then you turn around and there's one like over there too. And then there's one over there and it's just, it's, 
seems scarier to me. Yeah. At least in a cemetery, you could like try and persuade, like mentally persuade yourself that it was the stonemason did it. It's just their marking <laughs> to say that they, you know, maker's mark. Or, you know, you could delude yourself somewhat. But if you're in the yeah. forest, I don't think you could. However, I would prefer to find them in the trees because that's more interesting. And that's cooler yeah. and creepier and freakier. Yeah. 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 <sighs> All right. Next one. Would you rather be covered in regurgitated blood or eat your sibling's heart ashes? An awful question. Tuberculosis not included. Oh, that's better. Yeah, you don't have to get tuberculosis. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, the regurgitated blood being covered and it wouldn't be so bad, but I mean, by definition, I had to have drank it all first, and that seems gross. But I don't know what heart ashes mm -hmm. taste like. Mm hmm Yeah, well, and yeah. Ugh. I guess I'll be covered in regurgitated blood. Yeah. Why am I thinking if you just added it into a little bit of cream cheese on some nice salt and pepper crackers? It might be yeah, quite I mean, nice. Maybe it's just ashes, right? I mean, you can... <laughs> I don't know. It's a little dusty. Well, and it's a little charred. Know, and... Just a little, little I don't know how well we've all been what to kind of ashes a heart turns into, you know, if they're kind of greasy or mm. uh, big. Mm. <laughs> oh, oh, that I don't know why, but that just made it even grosser. I don't <laughs> greasy big heart ashes. Big big greasy heart ashes. They do not sound appetizing at all. I've had pork scratching, so I could probably do the heart ashes quite easy. Okay. No, I'm going to be covered in blood. I don't mind it. I I plan on working that out for cosplay, so <laughs> I, I don't mind it. It won't be the first time. It won't be the last time. <laughs> Claire and I talked about, yesterday we talked about um how much blood it takes to be covered yes. in blood. You know, how... And, and I explained to her, you know, I've done this in cosplay before, and I had a bottle of fake blood about like this, and I only used a tiny amount to just completely cover myself. So now we're going to test Ooh. it out. How much I think we need to blood. contextualize that size for audio. The, the size was a kind of UK beer mm. versus the size of <laughs> a stubby. <laughs> it's a stubby. It's it's a stubby blood. amount of beer that <laughs> covered me completely. So, yeah. Good references, Claire. Very good. You've cleared it up. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, like, how much can I get in my mouth and spit back out? You still need a pump. I think you need a pump. And you really want to get, like, height on it, too. Because you... <laughs> if okay. at all possible, it's supposed to, like, splash up over your forehead and, like, onto your hair. Like, okay. you've really got to okay. give it some oomph. Do you okay. know in Team America when good. they do the vomit good that reference. just keeps going and going and going? Careful. Just be careful if you're actually going to try spitting. Like, don't like choke on it. I'm, I'm, I'm worried for you now. This seems like dangerous, <laughs> dangerous cosplay. Kind of <laughs> I think you're going to lose an eye. That's what's going to happen. I might. <laughs> Look, I almost drowned myself when I was doing Beth Revis's cosplay. So that is true. It'll be okay. <laughs> but hey, I have a tube. I used a tube for that one. So I have a, I have a tube. I can just pump All more right. blood into it. And it'll be like comically vomiting on a sketch TV show. Do you have a leaf blower? Because you could like get the leaf blower, attach it to the tube, and then use that to just whoosh it up. And it'd be like a I feel like that's spout. too much. Oh. That's too much. It would be too spattery. I think spattery. it'd be comical. <laughs> This is not a funny situation. I'm this sorry, but we've gone down the Dracula <laughs> Dead and Loving It route. It's got to be done. <laughs> I'm just going to get... S Wait, let me go and stand behind this pillar. <laughs> Mistake. Oh, my gosh. Okay. What's happening, Claire? You're eating your you're eating your hard ashes, and we're getting covered in regurgitated blood. Is that one? Yeah, I've got. I, I think I could like like a nice cream cheese would be nice with it, and some crackers. You know, have like an, a charcuterie board with it. That mm -hmm. could be quite tasty. 
Um, regurgitate the blood. Ah, feels easy. <laughs> but you have to barf it up. Oh, you see, I, 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 that's easy. Just give us a toothbrush. Mm. <laughs> toothbrush brushing my teeth get, sets the gag reflex off with me. So you know, pff, done. Easy. You'll need the toothbrush, but after. True. Do you? True. You would brush your teeth uh, after you regurgitate all the blood, and then you would just. Mm barf it up all over again because you've brushed your teeth yeah it's a never-ending cycle <laughs> it's the cross i bear <laughs> that's why you eat your ashes that's why i eat the ashes because it's with a nice cream cheese i, I yeah. think i must really be fancying cream cheese right now you must be <laughs> cream cheese and oh. nice sh- honestly a charcuterie <laughs> board and tuberculosis heart mm. <laughs> everything's better with a charcuterie board it's true it is true. <laughs> Last question. <laughs> Would you rather explore the Carlson house or Marie's mother's house? Um, Marie's mother's house. Well, I mean, technically it wasn't Marie's mother's house, but like that weird abandoned house where the bodies are. That right, right. would be more fun because it's filled with weird crap like weird unexplainable collections of crap whereas if you're exploring the carlson's house i feel like you're just like nosing through their underwear drawers for no reason like because they're your neighbors and not that that's what i do to my neighbors if i'm at their house i'm not like hey elbow deep in your underwear drawer no but um it's a research just you know like cozy it might be it might be nice to go through the Carlson's house, even though they died in it. They probably have some really good like leftovers in the fridge and pantry, so you could assemble a charcuterie board while you went. There's definitely yeah. a pie there because th- she didn't. She make a pie. Uh, she almost did. <laughs> she was in the process of. But so we know some... that there are there's jars mm-hmm. of fruit. Yeah. There we we know yep, that there's that lots of pie there filling. You should just, yeah, like, I guess maybe I'd go to the Carlson house just so I could stock up on pie filling. <laughs> it's yeah. the only reason. It saves your supermarket shop that week, wouldn't it? Underpants and pie yep. filling. Yep. Yes. I think, yeah. That's all you need. It just, it, it saved you the whole trip. Mm-hmm. It really would. Is that what, is that what the widow next door did? She just She's toddled over there. <laughs> oh, underpants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh like so nice. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but I'm having it. <laughs> don't go in the bottom drawer. Never go in the bottom drawer. What's in the bottom drawer? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, what are you doing, Claire? Marie's mother's house is as, as, as useful as it would be to stock up on essentials and non-essentials from the Carlson house because we're just robbing them at this stage. Um, <laughs> I like the idea of creeping around Marie's mother's house or like the house where the bodies were to ghost hunt. I'm going to go ghost hunting. No vampires, just ghost hunting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which one would be better for, like, estate sale purposes? Um, you see, I got the impression that the Marie's mother's house was fairly abandoned. Don't yeah, I feel like the Carlson house would be a little bit cleaner, and they would probably have, you know, the just perfect, like, kitschy mm-hmm. stuff. So I want to I wanna go in their house, but I want to pill for things. Not necessarily the underwear drawer, but yeah, that, yeah that I want to go to the cute, like, house. salt and pepper shaker set. Like, they, they have super cute things. Yeah. But they yeah. might have wedding mm. silver. There, there might be really weird, valuable stuff in Marie's mom's house, though. Like, that weird silk doll. That might be worth some dough. Yeah. The old typewriters, you know, dough. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, maybe that one would be better. If it's anything like video games, there'll be food in the toilet. So, you know, when you just find those random things in abandoned houses and video games, and there's always a potato in the toilet or something. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Toilet potato with your heart charcuterie board. It's a good ad. Yeah. I'm not hungry. I've had my dinner, I swear. (laughs) 
really good. <laughs> All of this is really great. That's the end. That's the end of Would You Rather. I'm good. It's the last one. <laughs> oh, those were excellent. It, it only got a little bit awkward. I love Kendara Blake so much. Yeah. I love her. I love yeah. everything about her. Anyway. <laughs> Go and listen to the bonus episode. She's yes. great. Yes. Oh, so good. <laughs> um, so, favorite final thought quote? I have two. Okay. I have three. My first one. I love stories. I said long, short, and in between. Yes. Me too. Me too, Michael. Me very too. appropriate. And my second one is all these bodies without blood, she said. And you won't believe in vampires? Yet you believe in God. God. So good. <laughs> like that. What have you got? This one, the very first time I read it, this one stood out to me. What are the facts about fiction? Ooh. Really, really liked that one. I loved yeah. this the whole time about Michael dealing with this, like, is this a blood drinker? Is this real? I mean, she's talking about a fucking vampire. And her his dad, again, it's his dad, like, well, yeah, she she believes it. It's the truth. She's she's wrong, but it's her truth. It's the truth. And she believes it. I love I love his dad. I love his dad so much. <sighs> Michael's dad's the best. Yeah. Okay, next one. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Mm. And then finally, find out what really happened, Michael, because the truth is the truth. Except it isn't, is it? Facts, maybe, but the truth is our own. It's tied up with belief, and belief is harder to hold down. Ooh. I just love it. I love the whole thing about is like, can you believe any of this at all? This one would have been really, really good for our unreliable narrators. Oh, month. it really would. It really would. Yeah. Except for Michael is reliable. Michael is one hundred percent reliable. Yes, I believe. You have to believe Michael, but you have to believe Marie. Yeah. And really. Are their stories that different? What's the truth? No one knows. No. Hmm. So good. <laughs> All right. If you liked this, try this. Do you have anything to suggest? Is it Salem's Lot? To be. Is it? No, it's not. I'm going to be un- unapologetically obvious. And it's not Salem's Lot. It's not Salem's Lot. I'm going to recommend Interview with a Vampire by <laughs> Anne Rice because, of course, how can I not? I am unapologetically obvious with this recommendation. Fine. I listened to the audiobook after reading all these bodies as well because I had to. It was just natural. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> going to give you the summary from Waterstones because the Goodreads one was as long as one of our summaries. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Okay. If you don't know what Interview with a Vampire is about, where the hell have you been? But okay, here's the taster. In a darkened room, a young man sits telling the macabre an eerie story of his life. The story of a vampire gifted with eternal life, cursed with an exquisite craving for human blood excellent there you go excellent <laughs> what have you got okay so is it salem's lot it's not salem's lot oh it should have been it should have been salem's it lot. should have been it really should have been. um but look i struggled this time not with finding and if you liked this try this we can always find things interview with a vampire salem's lot but I struggled with the indie spotlight for this week because our recommendations that we got, nothing matched up with this one. Yeah. There were no tenuous links. Dang it. But I did find a debut. Okay. And so this is kind of a two for one. Okay, I'll let you off. Okay. So this one's called Every Last Fear by Alex Finley. 
NYU student Matt Pine gets devastating news. Nearly his entire family have been found dead while vacationing in Mexico. The local police claim it was an accident, but the FBI aren't convinced, and they won't tell Matt why. The tragedy thrusts his family into the media spotlight again. Matt's older brother, Danny, serving a life sentence for murdering his teenage girlfriend, Charlotte, was the subject of a viral true crime documentary claiming Danny was wrongfully convicted. Yet, Matt's never been certain of his brother's innocence. Now, his family's murder is overlapping with Danny's case. Matt is determined to uncover the truth behind the crime that sent his brother to prison, putting his own life in peril and forcing him to confront his every last fear. Ooh. That sounds good. Right? Yeah. I thought it, you know, tenuous linked. There's no vampires involved that we know of. There could be vampires. Yes, but there's murders, so... Murders and... Mysterious murders. Families and, like, it being put in the spotlight. The FBI was there. Exactly. No, I'm, I'm happy for the tenuous link TM. Okay, good. Tenuous link TM. <laughs> so that's also going to be my indie spotlight for this week since it's a debut novel. Perfect. I know, two in one. It's perfect. Yay! Yay! All right. <laughs> So that's it for this episode of Fictional Hangover. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. Join us next time as we discuss Silver Shadows by Rochelle Mead. It's so good. We're almost done. It makes me sad. I'm so sad. Can we do them again next year? Always. Look out for our Would You Rather polls on social media. Don't forget about our book club and monthly challenges on Facebook. Be sure to visit our shop on Redbubble at fictionalhangover.redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover themed merchandise and become a patron of ours on Patreon at patreon.com slash fictional hangover. Until next time, remember, the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. You can find us at fictionalhangover.com. Follow us on Instagram at fictionalhangover. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fictionalhangover. And on Twitter at fictionalhangover, no E-R. If you'd like this episode, check out our others and rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss out. And finally, special thanks to Liz Emerson for our music. You can find her on Facebook and Patreon. Thanks for listening.